Well, good morning. Uh, glad you could be here with us this morning for this Good Friday service. This is a time of kind of sorrow, in a sense. This is where we reflect upon what Jesus did on the cross for us, and Les will unpack that a little later on. Uh, it's a little bit different to what we would normally do, given the circumstance and, I guess, the, the emotional depth of what uh, Jesus endured at the cross. So this is a service of reflection. So let me come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we recall what happened on that Good Friday all those years ago and the significance of it for all mankind, we come before you now and ask you to be with us as we reflect upon what he did, what our Lord Jesus did for us, and have it unpacked a little bit later as Les opens up your word. We ask you to be with us and help us to understand it in all its fullness but all it's, um, it being as profound as it is as well. And we ask for your help and guidance throughout this service as we seek to do this. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our opening hymn, Man of Sorrows, and I'm calling upon Ria to lead us in that once again. Thank you. We are the people of God. The scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that Jesus intercedes for us with the Father, who freely forgives us. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and say this confession together. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbor as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbour, and to live for your honour and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. It does. We're now going to read from Psalm 31, verses 9 to 18, which you'll, you'll see on the screen. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eyes waste. For your grief. 
My throat also and my inward parts. For my life wears out in sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails me in my affliction and my bones are consumed. I am become the scorn of all my enemies and my neighbours wag their heads in derision. I am a thing of horror to my friends and those that see me in the streets shrink from me. I am begotten like a dead man out of mind. I have become like a broken vessel for I hear the whispering of many and fear is on every side while they plot together against me and scheme to take away my life. But in you, Lord, have I put my trust. I have said, you are my God. All my days are in your hand. O oh, deliver me from the powers of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face to shine upon your servant and save me for your mercy's sake. Amen. The next two readings are brought to us by Judy. Thank you. The first reading will come from Isaiah chapter 52, starting at verse 13. See, my servant will always act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so dis disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For that what they were not told, they will see. What they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was signed a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offspring for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. A second reading is from the Gospel of John, and it is chapter 18. And begin at verse 33. 
Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Report, retorted Pilate. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Judy. It's now time to hear God's word unraveled. I call upon Les to do that. Thanks, mate. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be with you for this Good Friday service. And if you're following in the scriptures, we're in John chapter 18 and beginning at verse 33. But I'll just lead us in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We pray as we consider it now that you would be pleased to teach to guide and to strengthen us, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at an incident that took place in the early hours of the first Good Friday morning. There's a real sense of urgency that the religious elite of Israel get things signed, sealed and delivered because they want to celebrate the Passover. Just for a point of reflection, it's a sad reality that throughout the world in many nations we see a, a principle that is quite frightening and that is that governments, militant organisation, they use the premise of national security and national stability for the reason of persecuting Christians. And it was true in the days of the Apostles, it was clear in the days of the Protestant Reformation, and sadly it's still true in our own day. Humanity fears the truth. And the reality is that evangelical Christians are beaten, they are sentenced to death, where communism rules, where Hinduism rules, where Islam rules, and the reality is all of these folk are threatened by genuine faith and ultimately truth. If we go back into Jesus' earlier discourse in John 15, I'm reading from verse 18 and 19, which really sets the context for this incident here. You'll see there in verse 18, the Lord Jesus says, as he addresses his disciples, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Verse 19, if you're of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I choose you, chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Down in chapter 16, verse 1, I have said all this to you to keep you from falling away. So we see in our text that Jesus is condemned to death by the leadership of his day. And what is the reason behind it? The reason is that he claimed to be the Son of God. For them, there is a problem because at this stage, only the Romans who were in power could execute. So we see in the text this morning that Jesus is taken before Pilate because he is Roman authority in Judea as its governor. 
And basically the principle that we're looking at this morning is in their mind, they needed to win Roman approval. And their point was that Jesus is committing sedition against the state. Why? Because he proclaimed himself to be a king. So in reflection, in every generation, humanity has a decision to make. Will I serve Christ or will I serve Caesar? And I believe that that, that question is so relevant for us today because the question of where authority prevails in our life is so important as we exist in a contemporary culture. Is it Christ and his word of truth or is it the value and authority of a humanistic government? Is Christ a personal king or do you and I really serve another king? So in the text before us we see that Jesus in the early hours of this morning is hustled from place to place and now the authorities take him very seriously because to them Jesus is no common criminal. The stability of the state is at stake. If we go back into Luke chapter 23, and I'm reading from Luke 23 and verse 2, and it says, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is a king. So the issue is sedition. That's what they are driving at. So the point is he's brought before Pilate because he is a danger in their minds to them politically. His kingdom and power is his church and that is in opposition to our power and authority on earth. So what do the Jews do? Well, we see them in this incident. They play the card that is most significant to Roman rule in Palestine. What will you do to the man who threatens political stability in Palestine? That's the issue that we're considering this morning and how that applies to us. So the first question is, what is this all about? And I believe that's the question that Pilate is asking. If we pick it up in verse 33, and it says there that Pilate enters the praetorium and called Jesus, are you king of the Jews? So I take it that his first question is one that really centers on disbelief. That is, are you king of the Jews? Now, if we recall early days in Bethlehem, Matthew 2 and verse 2, we remember that wise men from the east came and asked the question, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, 30 years have passed, and the man who stands before Pilate doesn't look like a king. In fact, he doesn't even look like a troublemaker. Back in John chapter 1, John the baptizer described him as the Lamb of God. So we've got these inconsistencies in the argument. My guess is that Pilate thought everyone in this fiasco here in Judea where I don't want to be is absolutely mad. This is ridiculous. Do I really need to put up with this? Well, notice how Jesus responds. And you'll see that he does not answer the question directly. And I take it the reason is that Pilate's question was not serious. I'm suggesting that when we look at this question in the context, his question is dismissive. He doesn't really want to be bothered with this nonsense. So Jesus speaks in a way that challenges Pilate's pride. Verse 34, basically he's saying, tell me, Pilate, have you worked this out? Or is this what others are telling you? Bang on. 
Jesus has read the context well. So we say at this point, we can see that Pilate needs to consider what kind of a king are we talking about here? And it's obvious that Pilate doesn't really understand the real issue here. So if Jesus says, yes, I am a king, Pilate could say, okay, as a king, I know what I must do as a Roman ruler, how I must respond to this. But if Jesus says no, he would be misleading because the reality is he was a king. But he was a king who was profoundly different to Pilate's description, not only of a king, but of Pilate's understanding. So Pilate really needs to know. A political king? No. But a king in the hearts of men and women? Yes. Notice his response in verse 35. You know, what do I really care about this Jewish stuff? This is not my problem. You've been brought here by your own people. They have their reasons, so what have you done? So now Jesus has the opportunity to explain the nature of his kingship, for that is at the very centre of the text. Well, what are the lessons here from this first point. Firstly, we see that not only God's enemies that express their hatred and contempt for the things of God, but collectively fallen humanity is false to matters of truth in conscience. If we go back to verse 28, we see that the Jews did not want to enter the Praetorium, Roman ground. Why? Because they didn't want to be defiled. Why? Because if they were defiled, they couldn't share in the Passover. That is, false to matters of conscience, contempt for truth. So here we see them, they're keen to commit the most vile of crimes in the history of the world. They were prepared to murder God in the flesh. They were prepared to put to death the second person of the glorious Trinity, but they were not prepared to enter Gentile territory. We want to eat the Passover, but we will murder the Messiah. Well, when we examine the text, Pilate, he's unmoved. He couldn't care less whether an innocent man lived or died, his problem was he didn't want to waste his time in the pursuit of right or wrong. Truth or lies to him were irrelevant. That is a very loud voice in contemporary culture. So we see that the Jewish leadership, we look at Pilate, and we see two very different groups of people and yet, spiritually, they're both identical. That is, they suffer from the same spiritual disease of a heart that loves form, religious form, prestige, power, but rejects the rightful claims of Almighty God. Look at their hearts as we just consider this text. What do we see? They reject the claims of God, their hearts are full of unrest. They're full of hatred and contempt. It's clear that both parties are dissatisfied with life and they did not value the things that really mattered. That describes our culture to a T. The unrest still prevails. These uh, distinguishing marks are still part of our culture. But note the words of the psalmist, Psalm 119, verse 28. The words of a regenerate heart. There the psalmist says, I esteem all your commandments concerning all things right, and I hate every false way. What did they love? We look at what's going on here and these questions. They love ceremony. They love form. 
and like Pilate, they loved their power. Brethren, it's easy for you and I this morning as we stand here, as we consider today on this Good Friday, it is easy to love what Christianity stands for. If we look at the establishment of our nation, we considered about equality, truth, the sharing of assets, all things that produce a stable society come from the things of God. So we're impressed by what things look like. We're impressed by things that we do. It's good to belong to a church and to value the fellowship on a Sunday. But it's so easy to walk away and live like the world tomorrow. It's easy to live like the world every day of the week. It's easy to have a zeal that looks good like the Jews who didn't want to enter the praetorium. But in the sight of God, it's easy to have a life that is ruled by our own kingship. And we avoid anything that makes us different to the world around us because in the world we find it easy to be comfortable. Brethren, these Jewish leaders and Pilate, when you look at their lives, we can accurately describe them as worthless. Look at their privilege and their power and the freedom they exercise. What was it used for? Self. Nothing of real value. What was all this about for them? Well, we see it's a show. It's a facade. They lived the way they wanted to. What was right, what was established in truth, was irrelevant. And for us, we ask the question, what is life really all about for you and I? Well, I'm going to suggest in my second point, life is about truth. And this first Good Friday establishes these principles so clearly in the Scriptures. We pick it up in verse 36. Notice Jesus' response. He declares that his kingship is not of this world. Notice that Jesus doesn't answer the question of verse 35, what have you done? But he returns to the issue of verse 33, that is, the nature of his kingship. So his point here is, yes, I am a king, but I'm not a political king. And this is what Pilate needs to grasp. Verse 36, look at the point he makes, that if his kingdom were of this world, he would have servants who would fight. He would have servants who would protect him, that he wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. You can imagine the, the power of these words as they're being spoken before Pilate. Jesus knows that these people are way out of line. And he takes the point. Pilate, I've raised no rebellion to Rome or to the Jews, because the kingdom that I rule over has a very different character. The kingdom of Christ is not a political one. It's not one that is motivated by greed and self-advancement. Verse 37, Pilate grabs the words that he wanted to hear, so you are a king. Well, is him his reply? is an invitation for Jesus, I believe, to elaborate. What? Is there another kind of king? And we notice Jesus' response. He talks about the reason for which he was born, the reason for which he came into the world. Notice what he says, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So the issue is they are talking about sedition and national security while Jesus raises the greatest issue for humanity, truth. What is the truth of who I am? So what then is Jesus saying? Well, first thing he says, he was predestined to be a king. Let's go back to beyond Bethlehem, to the Old Testament expectations of the Messiah. Let's go back and reflect on the great purposes of God, something that Pilate had no interest in doing, and I'm 
going to read from Isaiah and chapter 7. I'm in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Long before his coming into the world in the flesh, the word of God, the word of the prophet spoke about this incident. But he came to bear witness to the truth. Let's go over into Jesus' words from John chapter 3. I'm in John chapter 3 and reading from verse 16. And he talks about God loving the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but had eternal life. And we go down into verse 19. What is the judgment? The judgment that light has come into the world and how have men responded? Well, they've showed what they love more than light. They love darkness. Why? Because their deeds were evil. And then Jesus go, goes on to say, then verse 21, that he who does what is true comes to the light that it may be clearly seen that his deeds are the product of divine intervention. In John 14, verse 6, we know it well. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we go back to the words of the Pharisees in Matthew 22, verse 16, they come to him and they say to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and you teach the ways of God Truthfully, they understood the clarity by which this man spoke. Later in Peter's life, when Peter is an older man and he summarised the teaching of Jesus, in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, he speaks about the teaching of Jesus as the way of truth. There he also describes the citizens of the kingdom. He says they are of the truth as they respond to to his voice. So we see in the text that Jesus is moving from a theological description and he deals now with Pilate and a personal challenge. And I believe what Jesus is doing here is giving this great and powerful man an opportunity to respond to his voice of truth. And if I may be so bold and use some license, Pilate, what will you do? What will you do as the most powerful man in Palestine? You know that I've been set up here. Will you respond to the truth? Will you accept it? Will you make further inquiries for the benefit of your own life and experience? And the question is, what does truth do? Well, I'm suggesting that in every age, in every person, truth forces us to make a decision. So what does Pilate do? He was now on the back foot. Well, verse 38, he said to him, what is truth? So what have we got here? What do we learn? Well, firstly, it's fairly accurate to say Pilate was not interested. He couldn't care less about truth. As a man of power, a man of prestige, a man of wealth, truth for him was irrelevant. Pilate knew as he gazed and has this, this in, interchange with Jesus that he was no political agitator. He knew that the Sanhedrin's case was an absolute joke. He understood the sham. He, he knew that it was designed to trick Pilate into disposing of a good man who threatened their status quo and their personal kingship in Palestine. But more importantly, 
He read Jesus' challenge to his own personal thinking. What is truth? It's irrelevant to a man like me. So he shrugs his shoulders and he dismisses the charge, what is truth? Now, brethren here, I believe that Pilate is not being a philosopher. I think he reveals the fact that he is a man who is enslaved to his own scepticism. He nearly didn't want an answer because he stood with truth staring him in the face. Jesus is the truth, but he can't see it, and nor does he want to enter into thinking about it. And I'm saying this morning, brethren, well, what's new? What is new? Because Pilate's attitude is contemporary thinking. We live in a culture identical to the things that we're seeing verbalised by Pilate 2,000 years ago. In a nutshell, here is our culture etched into the pages of Scripture. Because we know that today in our own generation, is there a thing that is called and recognised as absolute truth? Reality is, most people don't want to know. And if they do consider the matter, they feel that they have all the time in the world to defer the issue. And we look at the learned philosophers of our age, and for them a conclusive right or wrong, truth or error, is irrelevant. Because if they remain neutral, they can be on a higher plane because they can continue to ponder. But the reality is in their pondering, they conclusively reject the truth that stands before them in the Scriptures. And their point is, and they will say this to you and I over and over again, it may be truth for you, but not for me. Now, the Apostle Paul found himself in this context when he went to that great Greek city of Athens and he preached there in the Areopagus and he draws together their poets and the reality of the day of judgment. We see the response I'm reading from Acts 13 and verse Acts 17, verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. We'll be stimulated by this conversation at another time. In Luke 11, verse 23, the Lord Jesus said quite decisively, he who is not for me is against me. So what does Pilate, what does the contemporary liberator, liberated thinker and his position prove to us on this Good Friday? Well, that the kingdom of God with the Lord Jesus Christ as the only king will always be opposed by the world. And the reality is, why? Well, Ephesians 2 verse 1 tells us the reason why is that we are born dead in sin. And by nature coming into this world, our eyes are shut and our ears are deafened and our hearts are closed and they're hardened in rebellion and our consciences are seared and our minds are closed to the truth of the reality of who God is and what he demands of his creatures. Because Jesus Christ is the ruler of the world. He is Lord of all. And I believe the question for us this morning is, what would it take to defeat the reality of the depth of sin in you and I? Well, it's the cross of Christ. That's why we're here today, to remember the cross of Christ. And what did it do? Well, it set the people of God who felt the weight of their sin free. What did it take? The death of the eternal deity himself. And that's why we're here this morning. Today we remember the cross of Christ 
our freedom, our liberty. Today, we will not forget the cross of Christ. The word of the prophet Isaiah declared in Isaiah and chapter 35. I want to read these most powerful words. I'm reading from Isaiah 35, and verse 5, and he speaks of the coming of Messiah. And there it says, and these words come to our heart and they give us great hope. It says, For then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. That's what we celebrate today. We have come to understand the depth of our sin. We've come to respond again, to reflect on the cross of Christ. Well, let me conclude, brethren. Let me leave you with a thought. Can truth be discovered? Yes, but only in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm saying today that never once has God left any genuine seeker without light. Never once has God given no guidance to those who have asked for it. The only reason that humanity cannot discover truth is because of a deep-centred pride that flows from our nature that is dead in sin. Never once did any person go down on their knees and wholeheartedly ask God to show them, and he would not answer. But laziness in seeking truth will destroy us. And that's what we have in the record of Pilate on this first Good Friday. If we search the scriptures diligently, if we believe what they say, if we deal openly and honestly with our conscience, that is, the remnant of God in all of us, and if we see our need, and we see that man hanging upon that cross who, can, who, convict, who was convicted of no crime, and we recognise that that man died in our place, then we can see our sin, our depravity, our rebellion dealt with once and for all in the man Jesus Christ. No person who does these things will ever miss the way to heaven. May God bless his word to us this morning. Let me pray. Our Father, we do thank you for these things recorded for us. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who willingly walked this path so that we might be set free from the chains of death that imprison us. Lord, we thank you for your death and your resurrection and we pray with all humility in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Liz, for that. We're going to uh, stand now and sing our offertory song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Well sung, thank you for that. Well, there's something that Christians believe all around the world. Um, in a shorter format, it's called the Apostles' Creed. That's what the Apostles agreed upon uh, many, many years ago. And we believe as well. If you believe this, then we ask you to say this with us, with great conviction and understanding of what these words mean. Together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to now move into a time of prayer and Kerry Stewart, wife of Les, is about to lead us in that. Thank you, Kerry. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray to you now in full assurance that Jesus is appearing before the throne on our behalf. We feel so privileged and confident to speak to you now, expressing what is on our hearts. We firstly commit to you our leaders, the Queen, her representatives, and all who have authority in our land. Especially we bring before you our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, the Premiers, Members of Parliament, and all who hold office in our land. Give them wisdom, we pray, so that we can live in an ordered society, upholding justice and truth. We commit to you our church leaders, Ross and Leanne, Dave and Jane. Please give them health and wisdom, upholding and strengthening them in their service. Father, hear our prayer. O oh God, creator and preserver of all mankind, we pray today for our world gripped under the coronavirus. We see it spreading from nation to nation in an alarming way. We understand it can only be stopped by a vaccine. So we pray to you, merciful Lord, in your unfailing love, that you would help those who are trying to provide a cure for this virus, that they may have success. Sustain and help all the doctors and nurses who are caring for the sick. We thank you for them and the hospital care we have in this nation. Help us, Lord, to remain calm and to walk by faith in you as we go through these troubled times. We pray also that it would be a time in our nation where people cry out to you for help, realising there's nowhere else to go but to the throne of grace. Help us to be bold enough to point others to you. Father, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick and those suffering amongst our church family. In particular, we bring before you Keith Glover, Barry Ryan, Nathan Ross, Lorraine Harris, Peggy Lee, Margaret Lipscomb, Joan Barnsley and Lynn Collins. May you be their comfort and strength. Also, we pray for those who are feeling lonely, isolated, anxious, and emotionally strained at this time, especially in regard to those who have lost employment, those in financial crisis, those who have lost loved ones, and those who have lost homes and possessions in the recent bushfires. Please have mercy on them and may they know the comfort of your love. Please, Lord, give us courage to endure in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. Father, hear our prayer. Jesus Lord, we pray for those serving on the mission field abroad. In particular, we bring before you Miriam, our CMS-linked missionary, 
working in Spain with Jim and Tanya French. Please protect and guide them, giving them wisdom, especially in a country that's badly affected by the coronavirus. Also, we commit to you, Josef and Danica, as they serve you in Mexico. Uphold and strengthen them too. Father, hear our prayer. As Easter is upon us, we would like to pray for the troubled nations of the world that persecute those who hold to be followers of Christ. We know at Easter time persecution increases. Please give to our dear brothers and sisters who face this severe opposition, harassment, discrimination and violence, courage and perseverance. Give them the knowledge of a living hope and trust in you. Please comfort them by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray for ourselves that we would know the significance of this day called Good Friday. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that Jesus was obedient to death to offer himself as a perfect, once for all, sacrifice for our sins. May we know this in our hearts, know forgiveness for our sins and true repentance. And may we rejoice as believers knowing that we have been made righteous in God's sight and that our eternal destiny is secure. Father, we pray all of these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kerry. We're now going to move through our prayers and pray the Lord's Prayer, which will appear on the screen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory come again. Keep our nation under your care. And guide us in justice and truth. Let your way be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. Send out your light and truth. That we may tell of your saving words. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for we put our trust in you. We're going to sing our final hymn. It's There is a green hill far away. Thank you, Rhea. Thank you. 
we have some notices to bring before you, which are in my little outline here. Uh, this is what we call the wavelength, and for those of our church family who would uh, need access to this, you can access it from the website. Uh, also from uh, uh, another way as well, as you know. But it's available at our church front doors uh, at St Martin's, if you would like to drop in and pick it up during the week. Or if you can't get out there to actually pick it up, then if you contact someone from our pastoral care team, Denise Doughton is the leader of that, and we'll make sure that you get a copy as well. Uh, inside the wavelength, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. There are some mission prayer points for not only Miriam Bradshaw from CMS, but also Danica and Yosef over there in Mexico as well. Uh, there's an outline there of the prayer from the diocese regarding uh, in the light of COVID-19, which might be a helpful reminder. And there's also a reminder in there about how church is operating uh, through services and so forth, and uh, what's open and what's not open and things along those lines. Of course, uh, we mentioned during the service that uh, there was an offer for him. We keep that in there as a reminder that the important thing of ministry is we continue to giving towards Christian ministry so that you out there can hear the truths of the gospel as we've heard again today and to nurture people in their walk with God as well. Today has been our Easter service, Easter, sorry, Good Friday service. We thank you for joining us and we hope that you'll be able to reflect upon what Les has unraveled from scripture. But of course, you know, around these days, the coronavirus is all the rage as in people wanting to be informed about it. And it scares people and people probably think there's no greater virus than this. But I'm here to remind you that there is and we heard about it today through scripture. It's called sin. And there is only one antidote, one vaccine that can solve that virus. And you heard it through scripture again today. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ who died on this day, some 2000 years ago, for the forgiveness of your sins if you trust him as Lord and Saviour of your life. Well, today's about death. And you might think, what good is a dead saviour? Well, I'm here to say that Friday's here, but Sunday's coming. And it all points towards that. Thanks for joining us, and we pray that you'll join us again on Easter Day. Have a great day.